Amen. Well, we, were, we looked this morning at, uh, we were talking about the, the pastor's doctrine, the importance of that. And in particular, we spent a link, lengthy period of time uh, looking at the, the imperative of maintaining biblical theological integrity, the biblical imperative of that, uh, feeling the weight of that in Scripture. Now I want to suggest uh, some reasons why we need theological integrity. Integrity, In other words, the promise of sound doctrine, not only the, the imperative of sound doctrine, but the promise of sound doctrine, what it does for us. And I just got to mention a few things very quickly. I teach, when I teach uh, prolegomena and introduction to systematic theology, I will, I, I will talk about the benefits of doctrine, the benefits of theology. This is a, this is a slight bit different. I, I'm not just speaking conceptually in terms of what doctrine does for us. Um, this is more in view of what we're talking about as pastors, what we're talking about as, fu- as future leaders, what we're talking about as our future as a denomination. So there's some overlap with these, um, but uh, I'm coming at this from a little bit different angle given our context, the context of this particular message. So no, the first one, this should all be on your outline, but the first one is this, the sound doctrine defines our identity. It defines our identity. In other words, it reminds us of just who we are. This was one of the things that was so significant about that statement of faith uh, that we uh, ratified. Um, it, it was on November the 10th. I'll never forget it. November the 10th, 2020 of all, of all years. Uh, after a season of turmoil and uh, opposition and pruning that we had gone through in previous years. And in the wake of a thorough reworking of our polity, uh, the elders of our churches affirm the statement of faith. But what, are, what the elders of our churches were doing was really, we were doing something countercultural. You might see a statement of faith and think, well, it's just, it's a statement of faith. It's, it's orthodox. It's doctrine. No, it's far more significant than that. It's countercultural. One of the things, of, of all the things that many denominations are doing, one of the things they're not doing is is refining their doctrine. One of the things they're not doing is staking out their doctrine. One of the things they're not doing is drawing lines around themselves. But what our, what our pastors did on November the 10th, 2020, was to, to plant a definitional flag that honored our past, that resolved for our future. I mean, that's what that little statement of faith is. It's saying this, this, by the grace of God, is who we are. It was, a, it was a throwing down of the gauntlet. Do you know that phrase? Uh, you throw down a gauntlet, medieval knights, the gauntlet was the, the, metal, the metal glove that they would wear. And if you're challenging someone to a duel, you take off your gauntlet and throw it down. You ever heard that? So it's called throwing, throwing down the gauntlet, meaning I'm challenging you. Well, that was our pastors throwing down the gauntlet and saying, this is who we are. This is what God's word tells us. This is where we stand. This is where we will remain. This is what we will protect. It was a public commitment to ongoing theological fidelity. Even more than that, it was an act, it was an act of submission. Uh, it was an act of glad submission to the God who creates us and us and defines for our it defines for us who we are and who exercises his authority for us by his word. The evangelical church is filled with pastors trying to come up with new visions for who the people of God are or who their church is supposed to be. God's word defines who we are. And that's what doctrine, that's what confessions do. Confessions Uh, As one man put it, confessions structure our identities. And biblical truth preserves our identities. David Wells again. I'm giving you another quote from this gentleman. Authoritative truth lies at the heart of Christian life and practice. For this is what it means to live under the authority of Scripture. It is in this core of confession that the church's identity is preserved across the ages. Thank you, Ms. Carr. 
This is the watchword by which it is known. Without this knowledge, it is bereft. In other words, it lacks what defines the church as the people of God. Bereft of the means of belief, worship, sustenance, proclamation, service. I love that. What you, got, what you folks did on Sunday as you're, you're doing the Heidelberg Catechism, uh, you're, it's one of the things that's happening there, you're not just enhancing your worship, you're structuring people's identities. You're structuring their mind. Oh, this is who we are. This is what we believe. When we sing songs that proclaim rich biblical truths, we're, te- we're not just having emotional experience. We're telling ourselves, we're telling the world, this is who we are. We're, remind- we're looking at each other in the eyes and reminding ourselves, this is who we are. We didn't create this. We don't shape it and form it. And we don't let the culture tell us who we are. No, this, God's word tells us who we are. So brothers, if our doctrine is marginalized, or if it is minimized, or if it ceases to function, we won't know who we are. We will have cut ourselves off from the people of God throughout the ages. And you know what you do when you cut yourself off from God's word, when you cut yourself off from the heritage of God's word that has defined the people of God throughout the ages? You know what happens? The culture will begin to define who you are. You will be shaped and molded and defined by the culture. And if you're not standing firm on the truth of God's word as a pastor, you're leaving your people vulnerable to the culture. So this is fundamental. Sound doctrine defines our identity. That's the first promise that theology holds for us. Solid theology. The second, this leads to another benefit of theological integrity. First of all, or second, sound doctrine unifies us. Indeed, at the end of the day, doctrine is the only thing that can provide enduring unity. Uh, One of the the great virtues, again, of that statement of faith, um, because of the role that it plays, uh, it's not a private document. In other words, it's not a list of private beliefs. Uh, It it confesses and celebrates glorious realities that have shaped our lives and that bind us together. There's a lot that we have in common. We have uh, a a common history, which you guys have been merged into and joining some, and a a new church plant in Sovereign Grace. That, That history gives rise to common values, common worship styles in in many contexts, common worship or ministry methodologies, you might say. But nothing binds us together like doctrine. Nothing binds us together like our theological commitments. Because here's what's going to happen. History is going to fade. And our founders, we've got a whole generation of founding pastors that are 60s and 70s now and we were celebrating at our last pastor's conference our 40th anniversary and I just loved looking out and seeing these gray heads they're a little older than me but uh, they were the generation ahead of me but they were I I just it was such an honor to be in the room with them but those guys they're going to pass on and you will may never know them uh, even if you're in the States, your kids may not, not even know who they are. Uh, as our expansion continues, uh, we're, we're going to grow, I pray, in ethnic and cultural and geographic diversity. As that increases, as our history fades, uh, the only thing that's going to endure, the only thing that's going to continue to unify us is the most important thing, the gospel we cherish and the biblical doctrine that we jointly confess and proclaim. You get my point, right? Michael, one of these days, is going to be gone. And, and maybe you'll, you'll be in Trinity Fellowship, and maybe you'll be an old man, and you'll have grandkids in this church. Isn't that wonderful to think about that day? They may not know who Mr. Granger was, or they may have stories, they may know stories, but they're not going to know him. Michael can't unify this church over the, the decades. 
He doesn't want to unify this church. He can't. Men don't unify. The doctrine unifies. The gospel unifies. Relationships can't ultimately unify us because relationships, there, there are pressures on relationships. Relationships can change. God can reposition us at times or someone is sent out to plant a church. And then what happens? Does our unity break down because our, the nature of our relationships change? No, not if our doctrine is in place. It's the only thing that can unify us over time. So it defines us. It unifies us. A third reason we need theological integrity, another benefit, an obvious one, sound doctrine when it is functioning, protects us, protects us. Our concern, and, and you have to be careful with this in a pastor's college. Our concern with doctrinal integrity is not just to, to be right. Oh, we're the, we're the really smart guys, or we're the really careful guys. We're right. We're not trying to win battles about being right. Do you know what I mean? Um, our concern is not just to be right. As Packer, J.I. Packer puts it in his book, Quest for Godliness, about the Puritans, he says, we're not trying to win the battle for mental correctness. Endless campaigns for our own brand of right thinking. So we're not trying to just be right. We're not trying to be better which we want to be protected. Errors in doctrine, false doctrine. It's the opposite of sound doctrine, healthy doctrine. False doctrine is destructive. It can be deadly. It is, as Paul puts it in 1 Timothy 6, a, a swerving from the faith, a swerving from Christ. Theological definition protects us from such swerving and from such danger. It guards our boundaries from the incursions of culture. Because culture is, is knocking at our doors. Culture is banging at the church's walls. And in many places in the church, those walls are crumbling and culture's getting in and culture's redefining. We, looked at, we mentioned some examples of that a moment ago. Vague belief does not protect. Definition protects. It's setting, the fo setting forth the truth clearly and sharply that reveals the contrast between truth and error. You see what I'm saying? If, if there's error there and you're, you're vague, then you can't tell the difference, right? But if, if your doctrine is clear, your doctrine is, is articulated, then we can discern the difference between truth and error. Error is set in stark relief. Generalities serve no one. Generalities serve no one. When, we, when I teach homiletics, I teach preaching, um, and we're, we're teaching guys to exposit the text, we, we want there to be textual specificity. Just saying true things about the Bible in general ways doesn't serve anyone. Does it penetrate? Does it shape our minds and, and penetrate our hearts? It's, it's precision that does that. And, and again, all around us, you just have to know this as a pastor, the orthodoxies of our culture, the orthodoxies of our respective cultures are competing for the mind of our people. All the people that will be in here on Sunday morning, they will be coming in from living life this week and being barraged with worldviews, barraged with competing ideologies, barraged with ideas of who they should really be or how they should really think. The culture's trying to tell them how to think. And I don't want the culture telling me how to think. I want God's Word to tell me how to think. So without, and so people come in, they need the truth. They're hungry for the truth. They're they will perish for a lack of the truth. So without theological certainties and the clarity they provide and the confidence they give, our people will be, will be vulnerable. you got to know that about your people. And, and it's, not just, it's not just error that our theology protects us against, that our statement of faith will protect us against. 
clear doctrinal formulations like our statement of faith, like some of the textbooks that you're reading in here, they highlight what is most important. That's what's so great about confessions. That's what's so great about statements of faith. They, they highlight, they don't say everything, right? They don't say everything. That statement of faith is not our Bible. But it does, it does draw a circle around the most important things. And so, uh, and, and this is especially important in a day where new ideas and emphases and fads arrive in our inbox daily, not hourly. And pastors are endlessly distracted and drawn to the new and drawn to the novel. So clear doctrinal formulation not only protects us from error, it protects us from novelty and distractions and theological fads. If, I'll tell you this, if, if there's a new theological emphasis that comes along that our theology has overlooked, nowhere to be found in our statement of faith, nowhere to be found in historic confessions, but it's new, it's hot, it's, it's, it's capturing the attention of everywhere, Chances are, it's not good. <laughs> and it won't last. Carl Truman, an American church historian, comments on this very idea. A church with a creed or confession has a built-in gospel reality check. A built-in gospel reality check. It is unlikely to become sidetracked by the peripheral issues of the passing moment. Rather, it will focus instead on the great theological categories that touch on matters of eternal significance. That's what we want to be about. That's what the gospel does, doesn't it? It focuses on the great theological categories of eternal significance. Number four. Sound doctrine nourishes our souls. Oh my, and this, this, is, this is another talk. But in brief, if, 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 we've been, if you've been born again, then the Spirit produces in us a, a thirst that only God's Word can satisfy. Did you know that? A person who's truly born again has a thirst for God's word, whether they know it or not. They, they are hungry for truth. Uh, I mean, why else? Why else do people love to hear you preach? <laughs> why else would they listen to us? It, it, it's, it's because they, they, they're hungry for God's word, and it's only through sound doctrine that our people will grow. That's, what, that's Paul's point in Colossians 2. Verses 6 and 7, therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. So you've received him, now, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, and abounding in thanksgiving. We and our people, we sim they simply will not grow in Christ. They will be stunted. They will be immature. They will be shaken by circumstance. They will be vulnerable to error. Some may fall away if they lack or, or move outside of the doctrinal framework of the faith. The doctrinal framework of God's word. The doctrinal framework of sound doctrine. As Jesus said... And Paul echoes, it is the truth that provides the means of our growth. What did Jesus say in the high priestly prayer? Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. There is no true sanctification apart from God's truth. No true, enduring, substantive, lasting spiritual growth apart from the truth of God's word. You guys know that. Number five, sound doctrine guides and fuels our worship. I think our history bears, us out, bears this out, and it does testify to God's grace to us. But simply put, theology, sound doctrine, it makes, it makes certain that we rightly love and worship God. Only when 
our doctrine is sound, will we be able to respond to God rightly in praise and worship in the truest and fullest sense? What are we doing when we worship? We're not just expressing ourselves, are we? We're not just emoting. We are responding. Right? That's the fundamental definition of worship. It doesn't get more fundamental than that. All worship is is a, an, a, a right response to God and His revelation of Himself to us. That's what worship is. And if we're not responding to God based on how He's revealed Himself to us, then our worship, that's when our worship becomes idolatry. Because something else is fueling that. Something else is fueling our response. So again, when we, we're not just emoting, we're not trying to have a, a, an experience together, we're responding, and we're responding to something particular, to the character of God, and the ways of God, and the works of God, and the accomplishments of God through Jesus Christ. So without sound doctrine, worship becomes emotive, worship becomes light and fluffy, inconsequential. Sound doctrine fuels our worship. Number six, this is going to be important. Sound doctrine shapes, sustains, and protects our mission. It shapes, sustains, and protects our mission. I, I, I won't go long on, on this point, but I, I do want to say this. If our doctrine doesn't ground and govern our mission, prioritizing the glory of Christ, prioritizing the transforming power of the gospel, prioritizing the formation and strengthening of disciples in local churches under the word of God, our mission will change. We'll lose our mission. And the gospel, at best, the gospel will be subordinated, if not distorted or lost. And here's what I mean by that. This is, this is something I carry a burden for. I alluded to it already, but let me, let me say it a bit more directly. Gospel centrality, which we love and celebrate and want to, want to transfer, gospel centrality, it, again, it's central to who we are. But for all its biblical currency, for all its hermeneutical importance in the way you interpret text, we do not want to drift from this. Are you with me? We love it. We're committed to it. The Bible itself points us to it. We don't want to drift. Yes, gospel centrality. Yes, yes, yes. Here's what I'm saying, though. Mere gospel centrality, merely maintaining gospel centrality, will not preserve us. What will preserve us by the grace of God, follow me here, what will preserve us by the grace of God is what lies underneath the gospel, which is biblical authority and theological integrity. Are you with me? Because if, what happens if you lose those things? What's that? Yes, you lose the very things that give rise to the gospel. You lose the very things that create the gospel. You lose the very things that define the gospel. You, in other words, your gospel will change. Its meaning changes. What the gospel addresses changes. That is the lesson of, especially in the West, of, of li Christian liberalism. You know what I mean by liberalism? Do you, do you, do you know this phrase, the, the social gospel movement. This was a movement in the 19th century, early 20th century in, in America. I'm sure it has forms in, in other places where the church, it, it lost its theological moorings, it lost its belief in the truth of God's word, but it was committed to serving people. It was committed to feeding the poor and clothing the naked. They, were, they had Bible verses for it. 
Jesus told us to do these things. So it was the social gospel. Now, so that, and I said, this is the lesson of, of the social gospel movement, liberal Christianity. The social gospel movement was, if we could call it this, they were gospel centered. That was their emphasis. They were gospel centered. But what was the problem? It was a different gospel. And behind it, why did it become a different gospel? It was because of doctrinal deviation and anti-supernaturalism and a secularism and a materialism so that what really mattered in people's lives was their material needs. So once you lose, and, and you men have to know this, once, we, once you lose biblical foundations, biblical authority, once you lose doctrine, then you are left reconfiguring the gospel, reconfiguring faith, reconfiguring mission. All that loose from doctrinal imperatives. That's what happened in the, in the United States a few years ago. In a, a denomination called the Presbyterian Church of America, uh, I, don't, I don't know if you heard of this, but there was a a conference that emerged called Revoice. Do you know that, that name? It was, a, it was a conference hosted by a Presbyterian church that it, it was a gospel to, that, that was meant to minister to same-sex attracted Christians to Christians and so, so-called Christians in the LGBTQ world. There were conferences about being affirming to such people. There were or messages about being affirming to such people. Messages about, there was even a message about how queer culture can make contributions. This was in a Presbyterian church, a conservative Presbyterian, well, conservative Presbyterian denomination. But it, what happened in this denomination was that there was a, it was sort of two wings in this denomination that emerged. And one was very doctrinally oriented and one was very missionally oriented. Okay? And, 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 and there were names for that. You may know some of these names. Uh, and I'm not saying these two men are men of integrity. Uh, so... They didn't. I'm not talking about Revoice now. I'm, just, I'm going back. So there's been these tensions in this denomination about those missional people. They're planting churches in big urban areas. They look to Tim Keller as their leader. So kind of missional oriented people. And then on the other side, they kind of looked to Lig Duncan. And they were, and I'm speaking generally, but they were, Lord, they were the doctrinal ones. You know, we're Westminster Confession of Faith, the Word of God. So you had these tensions in this denomination. Well, it was in that, out of that missional side that emerged, again, nothing that Tim Keller would have improved of, uh, but out of that wing that prioritized mission in the form of cultural engagement. Okay? So it, it, a view of mission, a view of the church's relationship to culture, an emphasis on we need to be engaging the culture, we need to be transforming the culture, we need to be, we need to be in the culture, we need to get our hands dirty in the culture. So it's a view of the church's relationship to culture, but uninformed by doctrine, uninformed by scriptural ethics. So these people would have claimed to be gospel people. They're taking the gospel to this, to this part of the world, this, this, these types of people. But what happened was, because they weren't doctrinally rooted, was the gospel that they were proclaiming began to sh be shaped and changed and and compromised. And I'll, I'll tell you this, historically, in, I would say in the West, but in seminary settings, you know in seminaries you have different departments, you have biblical studies and pastoral ministry and Christian education and church history and missions and so forth. Historically, in seminaries, it's been the mission department that has been the back door to heresy in seminaries historically. 
Why do you think that is? I'm not criticizing mission departments. I'm saying that has often been the trend. That's where heresy has gotten into seminaries. It's because their, their, their foundation is mission. Their focus is mission. Their burden is mission. And it's good to have a burden for mission, right? Christ gave us a mission. But if that is your governing category, then what happened in these settings? Well, they, we, it's all about reaching people. It's about reaching cultures. And so we need to adapt and we need to change and we need to contextualize and do all these things. And so when, you, when, when, when your target audience is your, fo- is your focus, then what you bring to that target audience can begin to be distorted because you're so concerned about reaching them that you compromise on what you're reaching them with. Are you with me? But with sound doctrine, with a biblical vision of a sovereign God and and a glorious gospel that is the power of God unto salvation for all who believe and a risen Christ who is going to build his church, oh, you keep those things in line, then what happens? You've got mission, right? You've got, you've got a mission that will be sustained, that will be protected, that will be fueled, that you'll be passionate about, that will be fruitful. But without that undergirding, the mission can change. So, as I said under this point, doctrine, sound doctrine shapes, sustains, and protects our mission. These four last things I was just talking about, I found actually after I'd done this, an old essay by uh, J.I. Packer that actually mentions these last four points and a wonderful summary of the purpose and effects of sound doctrine in the church. I wanted you to see this quote. It's, It's so well put. Theology is meant to function in the church as both disinfectant and nutrient, sterilizing and fertilizing our minds guiding our wills and desires, stirring our imaginations, calling forth praises, informing our pastoral care, focusing our message to the world. Do you see all of these benefits in that packed sentence there? It, it, it is a disinfectant. In other words, it protects us. It, it's a nutrient. It strengthens us. It fertilizes our minds. It guides us. It stirs us. It calls forth praises. It informs how we care for people. It focuses our, our mission, our message to the world. All right? Finally, this is the, the last point on, on the outline. Given the imperative of doctrinal integrity, its promise in our lives and churches, I just want to conclude personally with a few brief reflections on preserving theological integrity, sound doctrine in sovereign grace. And we're, we're diverse here, and so I'm not speaking into your particular setting. Um, so this is not specifically prescriptive, but I do want to just reflect upon a few general categories for us. General categories that will be vital for sustaining our theological integrity. All right? The first is this. Ecclesiology. The importance of ecclesiology. Uh, it, it's no guarantee having uh, the, the, our ecclesiology as it stands is no guarantee, but our specific formulated ecclesiology holds great potential, not just for doing church, but for protecting us theologically. The, the fact that we are confessional, that our pastors embrace our statement of faith and the biblical doctrine it summarizes, we, we promise to adhere to it, we, we promise to be guided by it, to be accountable to it. Because of this, again, our doctrine as a family of churches is not a private, personal, individualistic matter. Our, our doctrine connects us to a structure of church government, our ecclesiology. In other words, our theology is embedded in our ecclesiology which is mutually reinforcing. So our, you see, our ecclesiology protects our doctrine because it sets up a, a, a biblical framework in which pastors are accountable to their doctrine by being confessional, 
They can be held accountable if they deviate from our doctrine. So we, we don't just have a theology that floats free that we use as we want to. No, it's embedded in our ecclesiology. It's connected to structural, governmental structures. And so our ecclesiology serves to protect that doctrine. And, and so as we give attention to ecclesiology and, and the polity by which that ecclesiology operates, and when we see it apply in culturally appropriate ways in, in other nations, which preeminently includes faithfulness to the statement of faith and care and integrity in the ordination process. When we do all that, we're not just keeping the machinery of church going. We're working to ensure that our theology is functioning. So when we apply, so think about that ecclesiology. You had an ecclesiology class. You've talked about our polity, right? Here's what's happening. It's not just, well, this is how we do church. No, no. You're, you're making sure, by, by faithfully applying our ecclesiology, you're making sure that our theology is functioning, that our pastors are faithful, that our preaching is biblical, that our mission is protected. So the very fact that our ecclesiology and our doctrine is wedded together is a great source of protection and strength. It's something I'm very encouraged by. Second category, again, we're talking about preserving our sound doctrine for the future, is leadership development. Few things that we could do are more important to our future than this. It's why I'm here this week and why you sit in this room week after week after week. It's why the Pastors College here and in America and now in Germany and now in Liberia and now in, uh, I'm missing one, well, a, 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 an emerging model in Australia, uh, what they're doing in the Philippines. Again, it's not just theological education, quote unquote. It's not just, yeah, I want you guys to be articulate and biblical and, uh, no, it, it <laughs> Well, let me put it this way. It's, it's not mere theological education classes. It's, this is what we're after in the pastor's college. It, and I know it's what you've experienced. It's theologically consistent education. It's gospel-centered theological education. It's local church-connected theological education. It's sovereign grace values-informed Education, it's life and doctrine combined theological education. It's a powerful combination. I don't know what the future of seminaries is. But I, I do know this in America. Three of the historically strongest Seminaries are fighting for their life. And you would know their names. And I graduated from one of them. One of the healthiest, not one of those three, I was talking to one of their professors, who's a friend of mine. You know what he told me? Their MDiv program, you know, with the Master of Divinity, that's, that's sort of the standard seminary degree. It's the, it's the uh, ordination degree in many denominations. Their MDiv is now 60% online. This, this seminary is actually in my city. And I, I can remember moving to Louisville, going down there, and it's a beautiful campus, and they have a huge quad, a huge big area and when I first moved to the Louisville you'd go you'd go down there it's got this big open grassy area it was filled with strollers and moms and little kids and people just all of these MDiv students who had families that was just it was wonderful it was vibrant you go to that campus now you know what you see all over the place college students because the seminary has attached to it a college because their seminary, their MDiv program is now 60% online. They're not coming for the MDiv. 
And so they're pushing hard to survive. They're pushing their college. They're expanding their college program. And I was talking to this, this professor there, and he was bemoaning this. And he said, if we're, we're giving away our pastoral training to online education. What's going to happen to our pastors, Jeff? Because you can't train pastors online. Now, you can give theological education online. That's great. You can learn things online. That's great. Uh, I'm, I'm not demeaning online education. It's, it's a great tool. But you can't shape and train pastors through online education. Disconnected from the local church. No component of life. Watch your life and doctrine. No values being transferred. No discipleship happening. No local church connectedness. That's one of the, one of the values of our, of, of our pastor's college, being in the context of the local church. And we tell our people this, because we get a lot of seminary students who come to us, and they, all of a sudden the pastor's... It's like, what is this pastor's college saying? One of the things I say, and I say it over and over again, is pastors, guys in pastoral training, they're being pastored... They're, they're being trained for pastoral ministry in a local church, right? That's the context you're being trained for. So we, it doesn't make sense to us. We don't want to disconnect their training from the very context for which they are being trained to serve in. Do you see? You're being trained to serve in the church. Well, let's take you totally away from the church and teach you over here in a corner with nothing to do with pastoral ministry or people. No pastors mentoring you. No one watching your, helping you watch your life as well as your doctrine. Do you see? So I think the future of pastoral training, certainly the energy and vitality of future pastoral training, I'll tell you where it lies. It lies with the local church. That's where it's going. I've got professors that I use to teach for me. They teach in seminaries and they go, Jeff, uh, one guy's a really good friend of mine. He's a fantastic theologian. He says, Jeff, you guys... Everything else, I don't know what's going to happen, but you guys are, what you're doing, that's where it's at. You just keep doing it, and please keep inviting me. The local church is where it's at. So that's where the energy, that's where the vitality for pastoral training lies. That's why I hope you, I think you do, that's why I hope you appreciate what you, what you, you have here. This is the future. This is the future. It lies with the local church and institutions like the Trinity Fellowship Pastors College that are connected to the church and accountable to the church and passionate for the local church. It's beautiful. And you guys are tasting it. Number three, another reflection about protecting our doctrinal fidelity in the future, generational transfer. It's really just a, a subcategory of number two, but it, uh, I'm speaking a bit broader um, I think you know we, we, we must think, and I, I tell this to our pastors, we must think beyond those sitting in our pews listening to our sermons. We must be, pastors must, must be intentional in thinking generationally. And so that involves things like our parenting vision and instruction, how we're equipping Parents. It involves the education of our youth. It involves the vision we give our youth for the future. It involves the way in which we seek to protect them and to shape them and to give them a biblical worldview and to expose them to the lies that they're hearing from the culture. We're going to, going to be doing in January uh, of 2024... Uh, we're, we're gathering the rising generation within Sovereign Grace. It's going to be from ages 18 to, 18 to 25. If people are, fall out of that, that's okay, but that's kind of our, our target. It's called the Relay Conference. It, it's not, and what we're doing in planning this conference, it's not just, well, let's just do a young adults conference. Let's do something that kind of speaks to the needs of people in that season. No, that's not what this is about. It's called Relay. You know what a Relay is? Relay race, you pass the baton. So this, this conference is all about transferring the gospel, transferring our doctrine, transferring our gospel values to the next generation. 
I put on your outline an eloquent statement of this from a guy named Owen Chadwick. Uh, he was a, 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 uh, a, a well-known church historian in his, in his day. He actually played rugby for England professionally. Uh, but he was an, became an academic. But he captures this generational design of gospel transfer just so well. He's, Christianity, he says, was this. An unchanging gospel handed down by pen and mouth from age to age, generation to generation, mother to child, teacher to taught, pulpit to pew, that which has been believed in every place, in every century, by Christian men and women. You, you see what, what he's saying there. In the DNA of the gospel is generational transfer. We're not just preaching to people. We're, we're preaching with a future in view that we will not see. And I just would say, you, you guys are young, emerging, but you need to be thinking that way. Because, you know, you know that, that quickly, you're going to be a middle-aged guy. It's going to happen that quickly. And it, it's never too early to be thinking beyond yourself. You want to be thinking beyond, beyond yourself. So this is what we want to give ourselves to in sovereign grace. Finally, number four, uh, an echo of Paul's commands to Timothy and to us all. We simply can't ignore personal vigilance. Personal vigilance. We can have pastor's college classes. We can have conferences. We can strategize for the future. We can build institutionally, and we should. But all of that is aimed at encouraging and instilling personal faithfulness. Which means not only doctrinal precision, although not less than that, but doctrinal passion. So that the truth of God's word is not simply a matter of intellectual correctness, but of personal relish. We're not just getting the word right in our minds, we're feeding on the word in our souls. In, in our preaching and teaching, we, and this is a, this is, this is a danger for expository preachers. We, we, we don't just exposit the word accurately. We, we model for our people as we preach the intended effect of God's word in their lives. You become, as you preach, an illustration of what the word does. And you can't manufacture that. That emerges out of your own personal engagement with God through His Word by the power of the Holy Spirit. We're not just, we're not just doing information transfer. I'm getting ideas from my mind into the minds of my people so that they think rightly. No, I, I'm, I'm not, I, I, I want them my people to think rightly, but I'm, I'm concerned about more than them thinking rightly. I want them to lay hold of the realities that God's word points to. Do you understand? They, these aren't just words that we want to think rightly about. Behind these words are realities. You study justification by faith. That's wonderful. But I want my people to go beyond justification by faith, to go beyond, oh, justification by faith is a legal declaration of God by which he declares certain people to be right, regardless of what they do. Okay, good, check. No, I want people to feel they are right with God, despite what they do. When they sin, they can repent, because God's heart for them is not dependent on what they do. I, I, you, you see what I'm saying? The realities that justification by faith points to, that we want our people to taste and relish and lay hold of and lay, live in the good of. So that's what our preaching is meant to do, is to, is to help people not just think rightly, but taste and see that the Lord is good. I mean, you've got that kind of preacher, and I'm grateful for that. So that, that's really... So again, I'm talking about personal vigilance. I'm talking about pastors. We can't. And that's, that's, 
you're in a theological training session. That's a vulnerability. That you start dealing with God's word as a textbook. You start, your, your emphasis is on a test that you're going to, to take, a paper that you're going to write. I want it to be good. I want it to be right. I want it to be faithful. Yes, all of that is true, but you have to... I bet you found yourself last year, didn't you? At times, feels like I'm just passing... Te- that, that's, it, it just comes with the territory, but you've got to fight that. You've got to fight that. I want to be tasting. You, you can't... You, you, if you feel your heart growing cold to God's word, stop and take decisive action. You get alone with your Bible and with God. You, you warm your heart on the flames, the flames of the gospel. You get in touch with your need for God and the forgiveness He's given you. You you regain your sight of the glories and beauty and value of Jesus and all that He's done for us and promises to be for us. You take action. Because when you stand up and preach, you want to be the kind of preacher that helps people lay hold of that realities. That's when I when people ask me about the gift of teaching. What is the gift of teaching? Well, that's how I sort of define the contours of the gift of teaching in a pastor's life. We we want we make God's word clear. Yes, we make God's word clear so that people can understand it. That's one. You got it? But we also show God's word to be beautiful so they will relish it. And then thirdly, We show God's word to be practical so they can live it. If you do that in your teaching and in your pastoring, you communicate the truth of God's word so people get it. You you, you show its beauty so they love it. You show how it affects our lives so they live it. You're going to have transformed people. Bottom line, our part of our faithfulness to the truth Part of our doctrinal fidelity, this is part of your your doctrinal faithfulness, is loving and exulting in and drawing strength from and banking our lives and our ministries on the truth of God's word and the gospel that it points to. That's part of your being faithful, not just passing tests. It's loving it, drawing strength from it, banking your life on it, living it out in your life. And as future pastors, future leaders, at a pastor's college like this, there, there, there's few more strategic groups of men like you than you who help preserve and strengthen and transfer our theological fidelity to coming generations. Guys, this is on (laughs) in Addis, this is on your shoulders. Michael's here to equip you to do this. Josh is here to equip you to do this. And here's here's, and I'll conclude with this. Here's, Here's our conviction. It's certainly my conviction. Ultimately, this is not about theological stability or accomplishment. It's about pleasing God and glorifying our Savior. And over the long term, 15 years, 30 years, 50 years, beyond, I believe that we will together bring Him the most glory and do the most good, not by planting the most churches or having the biggest family of churches or having the greatest public profile, We'll do the most good and bring him the most glory, faithfulness to God's word and the doctrine it transmits and the gospel that it proclaims.